A lot can go wrong with a wild clay. It might melt at your desired firing temperature. It might be fired and then still come out of the kiln extremely brittle. A gray clay might fire dark red. And that clay that feels so plastic and wonderful might feel that way because it's a bentonite and it will shrink and crack into a hundred pieces no matter what you do. After digging and processing a new wild clay, you don't want to spend hours making a bunch of elaborate pieces just to find out that there's some major problem. When you buy commercial clay, the package or website will tell you everything the manufacturer thinks you need to know in order to fire that clay successfully. It may sound complicated and daunting, but testing a mystery clay is a simple process of trial and error. You just need to know which trials to run and what constitutes an error. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. You can also use these tests on any other mystery clay, including a commercial clay that you can't remember where you bought it, or a mixed reclaim studio clay. My testing process breaks down into two categories. I test the subjective experience of working with the clay, and then I test the scientific characteristics of that clay. The first thing I do is try to throw a cup with a clay. If I don't like working with it, I won't bother with the remaining tests. Next week, I'll show you how I evaluate and compare different wild clays while throwing, but for today, I want to jump straight into the actual scientific tests that I do. These tests will reveal all of the relevant information about firing and glazing this particular clay, including its shrinkage, porosity, color, texture, and strength. I'll start by making at least three small bars of a clay sample. It's important to use the clay as you would for your preferred making technique. One thing we're testing for is shrinkage. All clay shrinks as it dries, and in order to measure the shrinkage accurately, we need to start with clay that has the amount of water in it that we would actually need for our making process. When you have your clay processed and it's the right consistency, roll out a slab of even thickness. I start with a wedged hunk of clay and smack it into the table a few times. I turn the slab about 90 degrees each time, and I'm throwing it kind of toward myself, which helps it flatten out enough to actually use a rolling pin on top of blocks. This way I can get a slab that is a consistent thickness all the way throughout. Then I'm just cutting a square out of this slab using a spare tile. Again, it's not terribly important the size of the tiles, but it's helpful to make them all consistent so that you can compare them later on. What is important is after I've cut these into bars, I will mark on each one a 100 millimeter distance. I'm using a ruler because that's what I have here with me, but the most accurate way is to set a pair of calipers to 100 millimeters, which allows you to make a quick, accurate, and consistent marking on every sample. Measuring in millimeters makes the math super easy, so after this clay bar dries completely, I'll measure the same distance. Right now it's 100 millimeters, and if after it's dry it's 95 millimeters, I will know that it shrank 5%. Again, calipers are more accurate here and will measure to a decimal point. Don't forget to mark on the clay which sample it is. I like to keep some of the clay raw in a jar along with a description of where I found it and when. That way, if it turns out to be a good clay, I can find it again without too much guesswork. If you're testing a lot of clays, you can buy a big variable stamp and assign each sample a code. Then you simply stamp each bar note the code in a notebook, and go on to another sample. Or you can just scratch a descriptive name onto the bar. It's necessary to keep a notebook, digital or paper. I can write down the code that I have given each clay sample, along with a description of where I found it, the qualities of the clay as I found it in nature, as well as make some notes about how it felt while throwing and forming it. You'd be surprised at just how difficult it is after you've fired and tested a bunch of samples to remember how each one felt and looked when it was in its raw state. So I'll make at least three bars, here I'm making five, because I intend to fire the clay to three different temperatures. I will mark the temperature on each sample as well, so that after they are fired, I can have a neat little collection of test bars with the code indicating where I found it and the temperature I fired it to. It's just an easy reference to have. I choose to fire it to a bisque temperature, cone 04, a mid-range temperature, cone 6, and high temperature, cone 10. If I suspect the clay is a low-fire clay and will melt at cone 10, I might choose a common low-fire temperature instead, like cone 1. Then I let these dry completely. 
When they're bone dry, I'll measure them and note how much they shrink in drying in my notebook. This number tells me how suitable the clay might be for more difficult shapes and forms. A clay that shrinks a lot from wet to bone dry will require a lot more care in making and drying to avoid cracking. Typically, there is a direct relationship between how plastic a clay is and how much it shrinks. That's because part of what makes a clay plastic is the size of the clay particles in it, and the smaller particles absorb more water, and they're more plastic. So the more water they absorb, the more they lose on drying, and the more it shrinks. A sandy clay will shrink less because that sand isn't absorbing any water. So what is a typical amount of dry shrinkage? Well, for reference, a highly grogged sculpture clay, or raku clay, formulated to have minimal shrinkage, might shrink about 5% or a little less on drying. A plastic throwing clay body, whether that's a terracotta, stoneware, or porcelain, will shrink probably about 6 to 7% on drying, maybe a little bit more. If a clay shrinks more than 7% on drying, it's very likely to be challenging to dry it without cracking. On the other hand, if it shrinks less than 4%, you probably already know that it's not plastic enough to work with. These numbers are estimations and you'll always find exceptions to them, but it's a good place to start getting oriented with what kind of clay you're working with. So I make my three test bars, marking out 100 millimeters on each and then labeling them and letting them dry. Then I can bisque fire all of these bars. I'm currently waiting for these particular samples to finish drying. So check back in hopefully next week for another video about what I do with these test bars after bisque firing. Basically, I will show you how I calculate shrinkage and porosity, which will help me determine how hot to fire this clay and determine if it might be useful for functional pottery. Thanks for watching.